fact, I like to say Islam is the only way of life that from one angle is strong and cannot be wavered or changed and from another angle it is the it is flexible and dynamic enough to fit into any culture or to make any culture fits into it and this is what it this is a unique equality of islam because it is the deen of rabbul alameen so be confident of islam be proud of this religion that is unique be proud of this way of life that allah jalla wa ala sent to you as mercy and everyone is envying you because this is the only way of life that allah jalla wa ala wanted it to be global and adopted by any people irrespective of their time and irrespective of their space that's why allah jalla wa ala says inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun indeed we have revealed the dhikr which is the quran and obviously the sunnah of the prophet وسلم, and it is upon us to preserve it and as the prophet وسلم, said by allah by allah the days and the nights will never come to an end except islam will penetrate every single house in every single corner of this universe wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه ونثني عليه الخير كله ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن نبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله بعثه الله رحمة للعالمين بشيرا ونذيرا فصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد dear respected brothers and sisters the topic that I'm going to deal with in this lecture I believe it is the most important topic that we need to be aware of and we need to understand as Muslims living in the West. This topic, or in fact, to be honest with you, it is the main topic that is being debated uh, among Muslims and non-Muslims, whether in the West or in the uh, East or in the Muslim countries. Why is this? Because unfortunately, Muslims now are not in a state of power. And we do not see a Muslim country leading the entire world as we see with non-Muslim countries or with some non-Muslim countries. Because it is a natural phenomena that people follow the dominant cultures or the strong or the powerful uh, cultures. So they try to adopt to the cultures adopted by the dominant culture or by the strong countries. And that's why even Muslims in Muslim countries are debating this topic, which is, do we need to reform Islam? Do we need a reform? Why? Because they see that the non-Islamic culture is the dominant culture worldwide or globally. That's why they are discussing this topic. And for us as Muslims living in the West, we need to discuss this topic, debate this topic, and we need to understand it. Okay, I will address this topic by addressing a few points. Uh, I will put forward some questions that we need to ask ourselves when we want to address top this topic and understand it in a very academic and systematic way. Um, Normally, in such topics like this, in such topics like this, people try to define the terms. What does Islam mean? What does reform mean? Uh, what does the word healthy mean? And what does the word destructive mean? However, I will leave 
the definition of most of these terms uh, later on. Uh, but I will discuss the definition of reform. I will start by discussing the definition of reform. My dear brothers and sisters, you can find, if you Google the word reform, for example, or if you look it up in the dictionary or in the Wikipedia or in any of those uh, online encyclopedias, you will see that there are many definitions given for the word reform. It depends on the context that it is discussed. But when they discuss, when people, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, academics, uh, uh, different types of people discuss the word Islamic reform, they are talking about changing Islam in order to adopt certain cultures or certain contexts. Changing Islam either, Islam in total, or changing certain elements within Islam in order to adopt certain cultures or in order to make Islam uh, adaptable in, in certain cultures or in certain societies. This is the nutshell of the word, of, of, of the meaning of the word reform. Now, the discussion is, do we need a reform? Do we need to reform Islam? Does Islam need a reform? Does Islam need to be changed in order for Islam to fit within a dominant Western non-Islamic liberal culture? Again, the question is, does Islam need to be reformed or changed in order for Islam to fit in a dominant non-Islamic liberal Western culture? Or maybe you can say, do we need to reform Islam for Islam to fit in the 21st century world? Do we need to change Islam for Islam to fit in this modern world as they say? Now, let us address the, the, uh, the following questions. The first question is, we need to ask ourselves, why do we need to reform Islam? Why do we need to change Islam? Why do we need a reform in Islam? This is the first question. And I remember that I had a debate with someone about this topic. And I said to him, the first question I put forward was, why do we need, why do we need a reform? And then he got stuck. He said, what do, we, what do you mean? I said, why do we need a reform? And please, my dear brothers and sisters, I want all of you to ask yourself this question in the beginning of any debate similar to this debate. Why do we need a reform? And he said, well, because Islam is not fitting in in many Western cultures. I said, yeah, okay, even if Islam is not fitting in in many Western cultures or Islam is not fitting within the modern world, yeah, it doesn't mean that we need to change Islam in order to fit in within a Western anti-Islamic or non-Islamic liberal culture or cultures. It doesn't mean that we need to change Islam to fit in, in, in the modern world, in the 21st century world. He said, what do you mean? I said, just from a logical perspective, a person can say, this is not fitting into this, Another person can say, well, this is not fitting to this or in this. Do you understand, my dear brothers and sisters? Why do we need that? We need to change this in order to fit this into this. Why don't we say that we need to change this in order to fit into this? So if we want to say that we need to change Islam in order for Islam to fit into, into the uh, 21st century world, or we need to change Islam in order for Islam to fit into the Western world, yeah, someone might flip the coin and he said, well, we need to change the Western world in order to fit into Islam. Do you understand the question? Is the question clear? Someone might pause this, and why do we why do we give the judgment that we need to change Islam? Why don't we say that we need to change the Western culture to fit into Islam? And if we, if we put these points forward, someone will ask, yes, but 
Islam is wrong, that's why we need to change it in order to fit it in the Western dominant culture. And so you can see that the premise of this question is the person who is asking this question, he is assuming that Islam, there are some problems in Islam, and those problems in Islam make Islam inferior to the Western culture or make Islam having some mistakes in it that need to be fixed. And the premise as well, or part of the premise is the Western culture is the right culture from all aspects, is the correct one, and not only the correct one, it is the standard. And we need to judge everything according to the Western lifestyle. And if Islam does not match that standard, then we need to reform Islam. We need to change Islam. As simple as this. Okay? So this is the premise for that. And let me carry on by saying that when I said to this person, why do we need to change Islam? I said, look, apart from this point that we will address now, if you see... And I gave an example at that time, uh, the, the uh, result of the census, um, uh, uh, of the census in the UK were published. And I said, look, the census confirmed that the number of Muslims in the UK almost doubled in the last 10 years. In 2001, the percentage of Muslims in the UK were about, were, were, uh, two point or was 2.7 percent of the total population and the percentage of Muslims in 2011 in the recent census was almost 4.8 which means that Islam or the number of Muslims doubled in the last 10 years in Britain and some professors confirmed that the number of Muslims is far bigger than this, and they estimated that the number of Muslims in Britain may exceed 7% of the total population. It is true that migration is one of the factors of, uh, uh, of, of, of this high percentage or this increase in percentage of the population of Muslims, but there are many other factors such as conversion to Islam such as the high rate, uh, the high birth rates within Muslim families. So I said, this means that Islam is doing very well. So if Islam is doing very well as it is now, then why do we need to change it? And I said, this is just an example, which is Britain. Look at Europe in general, why Europe or many countries or many, many segments within the European continent became Islamophobic. Why? Because they are seeing that Islam is flourishing, Islam is growing, the number of Muslims is growing. Not only that, the number of Muslim institutions is growing, the number of mosques, the number of schools, more Muslims are becoming uh, Islamic. Look at the rate of conversion to Islam in particular with women. Look here now, we have more sisters than brothers. If Islam is that oppressive religion, oppressive culture to women, then we don't see this number of women coming to Islam and they are willingly wearing hijab, wearing abayas, wearing niqab. They are willingly restricting their freedom as they say. So why is it that we need to change this Islam while it is doing very, very well. In fact, in fact, despite the negative media presentation of Islam and Muslims globally, we see that more Muslims are coming to Islam. Islam was portrayed as an example in a very negative way after 9-11, yet the number of the copies of the Quran ran away from the markets uh, bookstores because people would like to understand what is what is Islam or what is that religion that motivated those people to uh, do whatever they have done and they became interested in knowing what Islam is and more people accepted Islam uh, the, the recent uh, the recent incident of Charlie Hebdo if it is a true incident anyway 
uh, the number again, many people, many French people came to Islam because they came to know what Islam is. They read about Quran, maybe they started to read about Quran in a very negative way from a negative uh, motivation perspective, yet they found themselves accepting Islam. So Islam is doing very well. So if Islam is doing very well, if my son is doing very well in this school, why do I need to keep telling him, you need to do very well, you need to improve, you need to do this and that? This is nonsense. So this is the first question. I can go on and on talking about this, but we have a very limited time. So this is the first point, my dear brothers and sisters. Always ask, why do we need to reform Islam? Islam is doing very well. On the other side, look, for example, at Christianity. The, the, the Christianity percentage or the number of people uh, who attribute themselves to Christianity in England it dropped from 79% to 59% within the last 10 years. So, Islam compared to any other religion is doing the best. Now, some people might say, well, if Islam compared to atheism is not doing very well. Who said so? Atheism is a fashion now and many people are going to atheism because they are not seeing any a hope in whatever the religions they are, uh, they are following. And once they know about Islam, they will see the truth and they will convert to Islam. It is just a fashion. Wait for atheism uh, in the coming 50 years and let us have a better judgment. So, in conclusion, Islam is doing very well in comparison to any other religion or in comparison to any other system. This is one thing. The other thing is, once we say that we need to change Islam, we need to reform Islam, it means that in the, in the back of our minds, in our subconscious, we have a certain standard and we want Islam to conform to that standard. We need to change Islam in order to have conformity between that standard and Islam. Why don't we, as we said before, we flip it the other way around. Why don't we consider Islam as the standard? And the question is, which should be the standard? Is it the dominant Western culture? Is it, uh, if, if we have this question, for uh, Muslims in China. In China, they hate the West, yes? And they ban many Western uh, cultural practices in China. So Muslims living in China, their dominant culture there is the dominant Chinese culture. So shall we say to them that you need to consider the Chinese culture as the dominant culture, as the a standard that you need to change Islam to fit into that culture. But because here we live in the West, we need to consider the Western lifestyle as the standard and we need to change Islam according to that standard. Then someone might ask, what about India? India, they have their own culture. And maybe in India, they don't eat meat. In India, they have certain practices. In India, there are some sects that worship rats. In India, there are certain practices that kill their daughters for gods. In India, there are so many other things. Shall we say that the Indian culture should be the standard culture there and Islam needs to adopt or fit in within that culture? So this is the question. Why do we say that we need Islam to adopt to this particular culture? It means that we are looking at other culture, other cultures, other than the Islamic culture as the standard, and we never felt that the Islamic culture is, or the Islamic practices, or the Islamic way of life is the standard, and we need to judge all other cultures or or other practices according to the Islamic standard? This is another question. 
I hope that everyone does understand this question. And normally, you find those people who are talking about this issue, they are coming from an, an inferior perspective. They are inferior to the dominant narrative or to the dominant culture, and they want Islam to change, to adopt within that dominant culture. So uh, please do remember this question. Then, uh, when we say that we need to reform Islam, as we said, we have many dominant cultures now in the world. The Western culture, maybe the Chinese culture, the, Jap the Japanese culture, uh, maybe the Indian culture. So, if we try to reform Islam in every area to fit in within that culture, then we will have a European Islam, a Japanese Islam, an Indian Islam, a Chinese Islam, African Islam, and maybe South Africa or, or South America Islam. We will not have a single Islam that Allah Jalla Ala revealed for the entire humanity. We will lose this, the ability of Islam to globalize the whole world to worship Allah Jalla Ala. So this is another question that we need to think of. As you can see, my dear brothers and sisters, I am talking from a pure logical perspective. I'm not saying Allah Jalla said this, the Prophet Sallallahu said this, so that's why we don't need to reform Islam because of this particular dalil or because of what Allah Jalla have said or the Prophet Sallallahu said. I'm just putting certain questions that we need to put forward when we deal this uh, when we deal with this topic i'm just putting logical questions that you need to ask yourself when you debate this topic okay again another question about which culture should be the standard culture uh, in order for islam to fit itself into it or in order for islam to reform itself uh, to match that culture uh, we spoke about the space. Let us spoke about the time. The Western civilization itself, it is evolving. It is changing over time. There are, the, even the values, the Western values are evolving and changing. What was acceptable 20 years ago, it might not be acceptable now. And what was not acceptable 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it will not be acceptable now. For example, I'll give you a very, very simple example. Yeah? Normally people quote the issue of homosexuality. In most, Western, in most Western cultures, homosexuality was considered to be illegal. In some Western cultures, it was considered to be a criminal offense. Now it became a norm. It became legal and acceptable. Now. Do, do we need to change Islam, to keep changing Islam in order to fit into any change or in order to match any change that takes place in the Western world? And same to be, same to be said about India, same to be said about China, same to be said about the Chinese culture or the Indian culture. This is another question. Now, for example, pedophilia is illegal in most Western countries, on all Western countries. Imagine 20 years later, or 10 years later, pedophilia became legal. Does that mean that Islam has to accept pedophilia in order for Islam to fit into the Western narrative, the Western dominant na narrative? Take, uh, an, you, we can give so many examples of evolving laws, evolving, uh, in fact, virtues or evolving values within the Western lifestyle. And same thing to be said, again, about the Indian culture and the Chinese culture, although I'm not very familiar with those cultures. So, are we going to keep changing Islam based on time and space, as we have said? Okay, another important question. Uh, 
that we need to put forward. What do we need to reform? If we say that we need to reform Islam, we need to change Islam, what do we need to change? What do we need to change? They put forward this statement that Islam needs a reform. Do we need to change the principle of Tawheed? That Islam is based on worshipping Allah Jalla wa ala and nothing but Allah. Do we need to change this? Where Islam needs to accept, for example, in, in, in Indian cultures, people accept to worship anything including rats. Imagine that kind of sect became the dominant sect in India. Does that mean that we need to change Islam and make Islam a deen that worships rats in order, to, in order for Islam to fit into that Indian culture if it becomes dominant? I hope that you understand this point. So do we change Tawheed? Do we change our belief in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yeah? Now, in the Western lifestyle, there is no sacred, no, 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 uh, no sacred value that is given to any of the prophets. However, you cannot criticize certain symbols within the Western lifestyle. And same thing within the Indian lifestyle, same thing with the Chinese lifestyle. So, this means that we need to accept to criticize our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to mock or make mockery of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order to fit in within the Western lifestyle. So, what do we need to change? Okay, maybe, maybe we need to stop the five daily prayers. Maybe we need to is change the law of uh, economy in Islam. Maybe we need to have a reform in the social life of Islam. And instead of a person, and this is what is requested from us as well now, because as you know now, they have changed the definition of marriage. And instead of marriage being uh, between, between a male and a female, it became a, a relationship between two individuals irrespective of their genders. Yeah, irrespective of uh, the, their genders. So they need us to conform to this and to define or redefine marriage within Islam. So from an Islamic perspective, we can have something like a man have his nikah with another man or a lady had her nikah with another lady. Is this what we need to reform? We need to understand what kind of reform is requested from us. Uh, for example, do we need to uh, change the five daily prayers? Do we need to change the way we eat? Do we ch need to change the way we dress? Now there are many calls that women, yes, women should not wear hijab. And this is the European Islam. They need just to wear conservative clothes and they don't need to wear hijab. But why is this? And what is the definition of conservative clothes? Again, it is not given. Okay. Um, there are many questions to be put forward. I'm just uh, worried about time. Uh, there are many questions to be put forward about which part of Islam we need to reform. Okay. Another question that we need to uh, to put forward. Once we want to change Islam, once we want to change Islam, which interpretation of Islam should be acceptable? The, shall we say that the Western interpretation of Islam should be the standard Islam? Or the Indian interpretation of Islam should be the standard Islam? or this century Islam is the standard Islam, or shall we have different Islams? Yeah? If we have different Islams, then we need to have different Qur'ans. We need to have different books of Sunnah. 
because there are things that you can play with the interpretation but there are things that are clear in the Quran that you cannot even reinterpret them such as for example the definition of marriage it is clear in the Quran no one can even change that unless we we take those verses from the Quran that talk about the definition of marriage yes and we take out the story of Lut alayhi salam where it was mentioned 27 times in the Quran that Prophet Lut condemned the actual of having sex with the same gender. We need to delete those and we need to have a special Quran for Europe, another Quran for India, another Quran for China, a third Quran or a fourth Quran for Japan. In fact, in fact, not only that, we need a Quran for the UK, we need another Quran for Germany, we need a third Quran for Norway, and so on. Where do we stop? This is a, 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 another fundamental question. My dear brothers and sisters, what is Islam? What is Islam? Islam is submission to God. Islam is submission to the supreme being, the one who created everything. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ The one who wants a religion other than, or a deen, sorry, it's not a religion, a deen other than the deen of Islam, it will be rejected. So, Islam is the deen that Allah Jalla wa Ala accepts. What is Islam? وَمَنْ يُسِلِمْ وَجْهَهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى The one who submits to Allah Jalla wa Ala. Islam is to surrender yourself to the supreme being. Is to consider the supreme being as the source of guidance for you on all matters. And... Why do we need to consider the supreme being as the source of guidance for all of us? Because the supreme being is the one who created all of us. In fact, the supreme being is the one who created everything. And that's why the supreme being, from a very logical perspective, from a very rational perspective, is the most qualified one to tell human beings how to live because he is the one who constructed them. He is the one who designed them. He is the one who created them. To Allah Jalla wa Ala belongs khalq. He is the creator and based on this, to Allah Jalla wa Ala belongs what? Belongs commandments. That's why Allah Jalla wa Ala said, "In al hukmu illa lillah." And Allah Jalla wa Ala says, "Waman lam yahkum bima anzal Allah, faulaika hum al kafirun, faulaika hum al zalimun, faulaika hum al fasiqun." And the chapter of Surah uh, of Surah Al, al Maida is talking about the hukum the hukum, the ruling, the guidance, that it belongs to Allah Jalla wa Ala, and the one who rejects the hukum of Allah Jalla wa Ala, they are the rebellions, they are the zalimun, they are the unjust people, and they are the kafirun, as Allah Jalla wa Ala said in three different verses in uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah. So, if we believe that the supreme being he is the only creator. We should go to him in order to take what? In order to take guidance from him. And this supreme being is just with everyone. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, لا فضل لعربي على عجمين إلا بالتقوى. There is no superiority of Arab over non-Arabs except by piety and taqwa and fear of Allah Jalla wa and that takes place on the day of resurrection. Islam is a guidance in every single matter. That's why Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hi aqwam. Indeed, this Qur'an guides to that what is better in every field of life. 
social life, political life, financial life, you name it. And it is the guidance for everyone, irrespective of the space, irrespective of the time. Islam was the guidance 1400 years ago. Islam is, was the guidance uh, 10 years ago. Islam is, will continue to be the guidance now. Islam will continue to be the guidance 1000 years later. Why is this? Because Allah Jalla wa Ala chose Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be the final messenger. And Allah Jalla wa Ala, Allah Jalla wa Ala sent him as a rahmah lil alameen wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. We haven't sent you except as mercy for the entire humanity or in fact for the entire creation irrespective of the time irrespective of the space so we don't need to change this islam otherwise islam will not become the mercy that allah Jalla wa ala sent it to the humanity irrespective of their time irrespective of their space the last thing i would like to say my dear brothers and sisters, uh, by the way, I always give this example that when you buy a machine, when you buy, for example, any, any, um, if, if, if you buy this machine, yeah, and let us say that this machine is, um, is an, an Android machine. If you want to operate, if you want it to operate and to function to the best of its ability, I need to refer to the manual that was written by the manufacturer. So for us as human beings, in order to operate at the best practice or the best of our ability, we need to refer to the manual that was set by our creator, Allah Rabbul Alameen, which is the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Two quick points. Is the Islam that we have now, is it the Islam that Allah Jalla wa Ala revealed or was it interpreted by clergy or religious people? My dear brothers and sisters, I'll make it very short for you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لا تجتمع أمتي على ضلالة. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the best of my people are the first generation, then the second generation, then the third generation. So the Islam that was practiced, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, during the first generation, the third generation, is the Islam that Allah Jalla wa Ala revealed. And when the Ummah come together on one thing, it means that this is what Allah Jalla wa Ala wanted. Allah Jalla wa Ala gave this Ummah the, this virtue whereby whatever they gather on together unanimously, irrespective of the space, irrespective of the time, then this is what he wanted from them, and this is Islam. Okay? The last thing is, my dear brothers and sisters, if we look at Christianity, when Christ, the clergy within Christianity started to change Christianity, Christianity lost its power to attract people. Do we need this to happen to Islam? When we start changing Islam, people will lose the attraction to Islam. People will start to believe that Islam is not the religion of Allah. Islam is the religion of this clergy and they will run away from Islam. And to conclude, my dear respected brothers and sisters, there are some minor issues that Islam gave a space for all of us to change based on cultures, based on time. For example, you wear this kind of clothes or that kind of clothes. Islam gave certain guidelines that you need to follow and that is not really a big issue to, uh, to, to use certain practices when you eat as far as you are following the Islamic guidelines that is enough for you. So Islam gave some space for all of us for different cultures to uh, adopt to try to fit in in that culture. Islam gave this kind of flexibility. That's why Islam is the only religion, my dear respected brothers and sisters. Or in fact, I like to say, Islam is the only way of life that from one angle is strong and cannot be wavered or changed. And from another angle, it is the 
it is flexible and dynamic enough to fit into any culture or to make any culture fits into it and this is what it this is a unique quality of islam because it is the deen of rabbul alameen so be confident of islam be proud of this religion that is unique be proud of this way of life that allah jalla wa ala sent to you as mercy and everyone is envying you because this is the only way of life that Allah Jalla wa ala wanted it to be global and adopted by any people irrespective of their time and irrespective of their space. That's why Allah Jalla wa ala says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. Indeed, we have revealed the dhikr which is the Quran and obviously the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and it is upon us to preserve it and as the Prophet وسلم, said, by Allah, by Allah, the days and the nights will never come to an end except Islam will penetrate every single house and every single corner of this universe. I hope that that question is clear. Is it allowed to vote in Islam? And because I promote voting in the West, even in the East in Muslim countries. Uh, and does that, or is that considered to be part of the reform within Islam? Yeah. First of all, see, we need to confirm that voting is haram in order to say that I have changed the ruling. No one said that voting is haram. No one said that the democratic process, there are many elements of it that are absolutely fine and in fact that are Islamic. No one ever said this. Allah Jalla wa Ala says in the Quran, wa amruhum shura Yeah. If you were to translate this ayah, by the way, my dear brothers and sisters, if you were to translate this ayah, you will find one of the closest translations for it is the word democracy. I know that people will, will uh, might reject this or not accept it. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ Yeah, أَمْرُهُمْ The amr of the people is based on consultation among them or shura. Now democracy is demus rasi, which is the rule of the people. Yeah, can you see the similarity? Now obviously, there are different types of democracies and, uh, and you cannot say that there is just one single form of democracy. I believe that Islam came with an, a very advanced formula of democracy. A very advanced formula of democracy that even Western cultures cannot even match it. How is this? Islam gave a space for people to select their rulers. Yeah, and that's why it is a very oversimplistic way to say that, okay, the ruler should be selected according to Islam. Yes, according to Islam, but how? How do we select the ruler? Yes? During the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, if you look at the way Abu Bakr was selected, there was an indication from the Prophet ﷺ that he will be the Khalifa. But the Muslims themselves agreed to Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now the mechanism, how did they do that? Is it voting or, or, or discussion among them? This is a matter of technicality. But in essence, it was the believers who accepted Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu to be the leader. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the authentic hadith said, يَعْبَ اللَّهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُ يَعْبَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِلَّا أَبَا بَكَر That Allah, his messenger, and the believers, they want Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Same thing with Umar ibn al-Khattab. Same thing with Uthman. When Uthman died, uh, when... Sorry, when Umar ibn al-Khattab was stabbed, 
he appointed six of the companions to select among them one leader. Now, some people say it is Ahl al-Halli wal-Aqd. The term Ahl al-Halli wal-Aqd is a very new term, by the way, my dear brothers and sisters. And it is a matter of technicality. It is a matter of technicality. How to choose? You might allow everyone to participate in choosing the leader. You might allow certain people, even in Western liberal democracy, or sorry, Western democracy, not everyone participates in choosing the leader. Yes, for example, those who are above age, the, the age of 18 are allowed to choose the leader, and so on and so forth. Same thing within Islamic tradition, there are certain conditions for those who can choose the leader. We can go on and on. Yes, so, and that's why, by the way, what is the difference? Think about this. What is the difference between al Khilaf al Rashida and al Mulk al Abud? What is the difference between al Khilaf al Rashida that the Prophet ﷺ praised and al Mulk al Abud? When he said that there will be a time of Khilafah and there will be Mulk al Abud. The Khilaf al Rashida is the leader is selected by the Muslims. Al Mulk al Abud is the, uh, the monarchy system, basically. So, you cannot say that uh, Islam is it, it, uh, Islam is categorically against democracy. No, in fact, in fact, Islam came with a very advanced formula of democracy. Now, part of the Islamic formula is that the lawgiver, the legislator, people themselves gave the power of legislation to Allah by accepting Islam. If they are not Muslims, obviously they will not take legislation from Allah. So which means that people themselves accepted Islam and people themselves accepted Allah Jalla wa ala as the legislator. Once he is the legislator, khalas. Once we submit to him, khalas. It doesn't mean that we will vote on his laws because we have accepted him already as a lawgiver. So that is done. So that's, this is in terms of the law itself. In terms of the one who implements the law, Islam gave us full freedom to select the, those who are going to implement the law and that is quite similar to the, 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 uh, the, the Western democracy. Uh, but I always say the Islamic formula is more advanced than the Western democratic formula. Yeah? So I'm not changing Islam when I'm saying that voting is allowed or I promote voting. I'm not changing Islam and this is not part of the Islamic reform. It is halal by itself and as we said I, as we always say that from an islamic perspective there are two types of practices the ibadat yes the acts of ibadah which means how you worship allah yes this is one form and part of that or related to that or similar to that is the hudud and the kafarat yeah the hudud and the kafarat those are related to Allah, Allah decides as he wills. So we cannot do them freely, they are heavily regulated. Other than those, which is the normal mandate actions or normal practices by people, Islam gave us a very, very, uh, gave us some flex, uh, gave us flexibility. And in fact, Islam is very, very dynamic and very, very flexible in terms of these practices. Islam gave us just the borders or the, 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 uh, the overall guidelines that we need to follow. Within those guidelines, we have full freedom to practice uh, whatever, whatever practice we would like to choose as human beings. Okay, Harris, what exactly are the guidelines of what we should reform and what we can't reform? Because some things uh, we need to adapt to the society we live in 
but at a still still not change Islam. But how can we live here without changing Islam? What okay. or, or like in fiqh, which things can be reformed uh, in accordance to the society you live in? Yeah. Okay. The question is, which things can be reformed according to the society that we in, we are living in? Um, first of all, leave the word reform. Because the word reform means that you are changing Islam. No, we are not talking about this. Islam by its nature, in its intrinsic nature, allows a flexibility for so many practices based on whatever the people want to choose. For example, this issue of voting and the political process. Islam just gave us the guidelines how to implement those guidelines it depends on the space it depends on the time so when we adopt certain practices we don't say that we have reformed islam no we say that we implemented the overall guidance of islam according to this particular culture or according to this particular space or time is it clear yeah for example i'll give you another example maybe arabs yeah used to wear certain clothes here people wear certain other clothes now islam did not say that this type of clothes is the islamic one you don't find it in the quran or the sunnah yeah you don't find it why i am wearing them this is a different story now the, is it allowed to wear the trousers, the so-called Western clothes? Islam didn't say anything about it. So the original principle is, of course it is allowed. And what is haram was mentioned, that you don't drag them, you don't simulate the people Allah Jalla wa Ala is displeased with, and so on. Yeah, You cover the aura, and so on. These are just guidelines. You need to implement them according to the culture and the space so it is a matter of implementation yeah not a matter of reforming 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 means it changing means that the islam that allah jalla wa ala revealed is not what huh? is not adaptable or is not uh, it cannot be practiced in certain times, in certain places, and this is impossible because Allah Jalla wa Ala revealed the Quran, revealed the Sunnah, revealed Islam to be adopted irrespective of the time and irrespective of the space. Allah Jalla wa Ala made it as such. Yeah. Yes. Do we have a question? Yes. We have a question from our non Muslim guest from the Norwegian National Television. Hello. Hello. Can we have some sound, hello, please? Hello, 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 <laughs> hello. Thank yes. you for uh, letting me ask a question, sir. Um, uh, society has been through a lot of uh, technical uh, changes since the message was uh, delivered. Uh, is it not uh, natural to? change uh, things according to what has changed in society elsewhere? <laughs> uh, I did not get uh, it. Society has been through a lot of changes. Is it not natural for us to adapt to the changes that happens in society? Did, is that correct? Yes. So the society has it changed in different ways? Yes. Yeah, such as what? Uh, medicine. Uh, medicine. Uh, cars. Uh, yeah, technology. cars. Technology. Yeah. L uh, laptops, yeah, phone, communication. Yeah, they, they, I am one of the, the, the so-called mainstream or orthodox Muslims, and I'm very advanced in technology. This is the answer. Yeah, and I always change my mobile phone <laughs> to have the latest one. And I'm competing with my teenager son, because, you know, sons, they like to change, to, to have. 
Yeah? But I'm not trying to be very consumerist. consumerist. But I'm adopting with these changes. Islam haven't said anything about these issues. Islam gave, sorry, let me put it the other way around. Islam encourages us to follow anything that is useful for humanity. Full stop. So if this is useful, it is encouraged by Islam. If using technology is useful for humanity, yeah, technology, any kind of technology, any kind of medicine, any kind of advancement in any field in science, it is encouraged to be adopted by Islam. Why? Because Islam wants the best for human beings. Islam gave certain guidelines, the certain guidelines, and within those guidelines, we can uh, benefit of those changes. That's why when the Islamic Caliphate was a real Islamic Caliphate, Muslims were very, very advanced in technology and science because they found that the culture is fostering, fostering the advancement of technology within those flexible guidelines. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Can I ask one more question, please? One more question. Uh, what, no. what are the uh, most important challenges for a Muslim living in Western society? Yeah. What are the most uh, challenging? What, what are the most important challenges for Muslims to live in the Western society? This is a very good question. I think the most important uh, challenges Muslims are facing in the society to explain to the rest of the society that Islam by itself is a mercy for the Western lifestyle, is a mercy for all Western people, irrespective of their, of their race, irrespective of their culture. This is the most challenging thing for Muslims. That's why they have to articulate Islam for Western audience in a way that Western audience would not accept it, but understand it. And once they understand it, eventually they will accept it. This is the most challenging thing for Muslims. That's why Muslims in the West in particular have to understand Islam deeply in order to know how to articulate it to uh, the non-Muslim people around them. Yes. Does that answer your question? Okay.